I can't breathe. George Floyd's dying words have rightfully shaken up America and forced those blinded to the senseless killing of African Americans by law enforcement to open their eyes to the horrors and injustice of institutional systemic racism. What has been clear in the past few weeks is that we are not going to watch silently. And that is why Bear Witness Take Action was created. Tonight is an important conversation, one that must continue long after this special, a nationwide gathering of creators, activists, experts, and celebrities using their powerful voices to raise awareness of this ongoing American tragedy, to benefit racial justice efforts, and to better understand this unprecedented moment of grief and protest. Among the topics we will focus on are the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and the long American history of criminalizing us and devaluing our lives. We will also talk about how technology has enabled us to bear witness to police brutality, the idea that white silence equals violence, and the responsibility of white privilege. And most importantly, what does it mean to achieve racial justice? Social media has given power to this movement in a way that the televised images of Birmingham in the 1960s empowered an earlier civil rights movement. Simply put, it has enabled us to bear witness. It has emboldened and empowered us to take action. Good evening, I'm Kiki Palmer. Peace, I'm Common. Bear Witness, Take Action will address the challenging issues we're facing through dialogue, videos, and music. Tonight, we'll be hearing from a wide array of voices as we write a new story for America. We will give context and explore and explain how we have arrived at this point in time and in history about the painful journey from 1619 to 2020, we hold ourselves and those in power accountable. As James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Ahmad wasn't killed because he was doing a crime. Why would he have been targeted if it wasn't just for hate? It could have been my son. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I don't know what happened. If somebody kicked in the door inside my girlfriend. As we supposed to feel protected by the same people out here harming us. Please. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man. You can see police here now firing tear gas into the crowd. Peaceful protests grew to huge numbers by the late afternoon. Protesters are calling for criminal charges. This is my first protest. If the younger generation doesn't help, who will? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I really want my children to be able to live their lives in the way that every other child wants to live their life. You have people in here that need your help. March beside us. Show us that you're here for us. Thank you. Thank you. Former officers are all in custody this morning on charges of aiding and abetting murder. We got all four. Change is not going to just happen on its own. We are the ones that need to make the change. The Equal Justice Initiative challenges racial and economic injustice, provides legal representation to prisoners who may have been wrongly convicted of crimes and protects basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. It works to end mass incarceration and excessive punishment, stop the prosecution of children as adults, aid the mentally ill in the criminal justice system, and confront the history of racial inequality in America. 
If you'd like to donate to help this important organization carry out its critical mission, you can click on the blue button to give to EJI. And now, let's take a look at a statement and message from the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, the subject of the award-winning film, Just Mercy, attorney Brian Stevenson. Hi. My name is Brian Stevenson, and I'm the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. I'm also the author of Just Mercy. This is a critical moment in our nation's history. There is a need for reckoning with our history of racial inequality and racial injustice that is dramatically on display in our streets. We are a nation that is not free. We have been corrupted polluted by our long history of racial injustice. There are things we haven't talked about that we need to talk about. We are a post-genocide society. When Native people came to this continent, uh, we killed them by the millions through famine and war and disease, but we didn't call it genocide. We said those Native people are savages, and we used that rhetoric to create this ideology of white supremacy. It allowed us to enslave black people for two and a half centuries. And the great evil of American slavery wasn't the involuntary servitude, it wasn't the bondage, it was this fiction that black people aren't as good as white people, that black people are less deserving, less evolved, less capable. And that ideology of white supremacy survived the Civil War. I've often argued that slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. We were promised freedom and the right to vote, but what we received was terror and violence and lynching for nearly a century, black people were pulled out of their homes. They were beaten, they were hanged, they were drowned. Uh, they were menaced and traumatized. That terrorism went uncorrected. It would be the police sometimes that would step away and allow the mobs to pull black people out of the jail and, where they would, and then li literally lynch them on the courthouse lawn. In the 1950s and 60s, courageous black people challenged this legacy of Jim Crow and segregation put on their Sunday best to protest nonviolently, and they would pray and they would fight and they would march and they'd be on their knees sometimes and still get battered and brutalized by police officers. The laws changed, but that narrative persisted. And even today, there is a presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to black and brown people. And you can be an actor, you can be a musician, you can be a teacher, you can be a clergy member, you can be an engineer, it doesn't matter how hard you work or how much money you acquire, you will go places if you're black in this country and you'll have to navigate these presumptions of dangerousness and guilt. I've gotten old enough to tell you that it's exhausting. Things need to change. We need an era of truth and justice in America. We need to commit ourselves to being honest about our past, to reckoning with it. In South Africa, there was a period of truth and reconciliation. In Rwanda, in Germany, there has been truth and justice. In Germany, there are no Adolf Hitler statues. In this country, the American South is littered with the iconography of the Confederacy. Truth and justice is sequential. You can't have truth and reconciliation. You can't have truth and reparation. You can't have truth and restoration at the same time. These things are sequential. You have to tell the truth before you get to the restoration, before you get to the reconciliation. I'm excited because in this moment, we have an opportunity to do more, to do better. I believe there's something better waiting for us in America. I think there's something that feels more like freedom, feels more like equality, feels more like justice waiting for us. But to get there, we're going to have to commit to reckoning with our history, to telling the truth about our past, to engaging in important dialogue and conversations. I'm excited that you are having some of those conversations. You are part of this effort. I want to thank you for that and invite you all to come and see us in Montgomery, but more than that, to invite you to continue being part of this process to change America, to lift up truth and justice. Let's begin with our first in a series of fully remote roundtables. The Pledge of Allegiance we all were taught as children ends with four powerful words, and justice for all. Tragically, that is all they are, words because justice has never been the reality for our community and for so many others across America. Although those words do not ring true, we still have hope, we still dream, we still believe that one day we can create a system that does provide justice for all, not just the privileged few. To lead the discussion on how that can come about, how we must rethink things, how we can reimagine equality 
and lasting racial justice. Here is Soledad O'Brien. Hey everybody, I'm Soledad O'Brien. The executions of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery have changed us, I think it's fair to say, as a nation. Everywhere there have been expressions of anguish and of anger and of protests. Our conversation today is around rethinking justice. And with that, I have a conversation with our panelists. Kimberly Crenshaw joins us. She is an American lawyer, a civil rights advocate, a philosopher. She's a full-time professor at the UCLA School of Law and also Columbia Law School. Kimberly Foster is an American writer and cultural critic. She's best known as the founder of the Black Women's Interest website for Harriet. She was named to Forbes 30 Under 30 back in 2016. Uh, Rashad Robinson is an American civil rights leader and nonprofit executive. He serves as president of Color of Change and has been doing this work for a very long time, like all of my panelists. So welcome to all of you. Kimberly Crenshaw, if I may, I'm gonna begin with you. This is a look at justice. Where have we been when it comes to justice and where do you think we need to go? Well, Soledad, I have to say that when I think about justice, I think about an old adage. We went down to the Justice Department and that's what we saw, just us. And I think what we're talking about now are the various means and mechanisms where the precarity of black life is at the center of policy. And that drives the actions of legislators and opinion leaders and activists moving forward. One of the things I've been hearing, Kimberly Foster, is, is this a movement, which means that changes dramatically, or is it a moment, which means we could be having the same conversation six months from now and nothing will have really changed? What do you think is different this time around, if anything? I definitely think we have the makings of a movement. I mean, even if you look at what happened in Minneapolis over the past few days, the Minneapolis City Council voted to disband the police department. That is something that very few people would have been able to imagine possible. And and the fact that we've seen that development happen so quickly, like we're in, we're on the brink of something different. And I'm really excited about that. Rashad, I'm curious, what's different now? And when we talk about dismantling or defunding the police, what does that exactly mean to you? Budgets are moral documents. And they oftentimes say what we value. And so when we talk about invest and divest, when we talk about changing policing budgets and taking away those resources, what we are talking about is putting money into the things that we know will help us fight for a better tomorrow. So then back to Kimberly Crenshaw, as you well know, as an attorney uh, and as a professor, how do you fix a system that has seems to constantly have a few bad apples have a fair amount of power and also that don't seem to be held accountable under the law many times. I mean, the number of police officers who've been convicted after murdering somebody or killing someone is very, very small. Look, I think what's happening now is that old adage that it's a few bad apples is really evaporating. It, it's, it's the bunch, it's the basket that the apples are situated in. Police officers can pull over black people using race as one factor. That's a constitutional problem. It should be a far more important part of our democratic process to look at what's happening on the Supreme Court than it has been over the last couple of decades. I think that's really true. Kimberly um, Foster, the protesters in what we've seen on television are very frequently white. And that is, in the years that I've been covering this, a big difference. And I'm curious if you think white people are gonna be critical for conversations about dismantling a system that serves black people badly. I think that we need as much help as possible. And I will say, when we completely reimagine how we relate to each other, when we invest in complete social transformation, then everybody's life gets better. You know, it's not just black women. It's not just people on the margins. You need to be with us so we can stand together in this fight and push for real change, not superficial reforms. I'm curious, Rashad, if we talk about dismantling police, speaking politically in an election year, do you have worries about how that's going to read to a big part of the country. Oh, so here's what's here's what they're advocating for. No police, people running wild in the streets. It's insane. To be clear, there's nothing that black people 
ever can do uh, to fight for justice that's going to be completely popular with everyone. And so I think that sometimes we think of racial justice as a thing that they have to worry about or they have to add it on at the expense of something else. It's the thing you do so that sort of black people don't get too upset with you and disrupt your speech. Uh, but I don't think racial justice is charity or the thing that they offer. Racial justice is strategy. I think we are in a huge inflection point. We need not charitable solutions to structural problems problems, but we need the type of change. And I believe that means that we change the rules. Tick off for me the two specific things that you'd want to see. I want to see a deep um, change to uh, policing budgets around the country. So there's a, a set of things on policing, and then there's a set of things that actually relate to the larger complex of budgets. That's on the written rules side. And of course, there's all the things that we need to do to challenge Hollywood and culture and all the ways in which the perceptions in our society actually create the demand for so much of the policing um, and the injustice that we see. So one of the things that defunding does is it moves those resources back into the institutions that should be handling some of the social problems that now no one is handling because of the voracious appetite of the police. So that's, that's, a, that's a real direct thing that we need. Until we're able to break that, a lot of this energy may go to naught unless we're able to pull the unions off the backs of uh, those who are responding to this moment. Kimberly Foster, I'm gonna give you the final word uh, today. Are you feeling optimistic? Do you see a timeline where this has to unfold or the power and the momentum is lost? I think people are understanding now more than ever that we do have power. Yes, we have been subject to oppression and repressions from these institutions, but if we come together and make our voices heard, they cannot ignore us. And that makes me feel optimistic. I don't know, but I certainly am feeling better than I have in the past. Kimberly Foster joining us today, Kimberly Crenshaw as well, Rashad Robinson. Thank you to my panel. I certainly appreciate it. Throughout tonight, we will be showcasing videos that were made by YouTube creators over the past few weeks and uploaded to their own channels. Let's take a look. People are dying because of racism. I'm angry. How many times can the same thing happen until there's justice? I've had to explain to my kids that people will find you a threat off the fact that you are a black boy. The world is safe for white people. The color of your skin protects you. My dad gets uncomfortable anytime I leave my house. <sighs> this is the world that my boys have to grow up in. Things that my dad says to me, make sure you check in with your friends. Make sure that you're safe. I fit the description of someone who could easily be stopped by police and have their lives ended. We have a president that's tweeting out that we are thugs for peacefully protesting the death of a man who was murdered for absolutely nothing other than being black. But when white people are protesting and rioting because their hair salons and nail salons aren't open due to a global pandemic, they're called nice people. We need to keep the same energy we have right now. We need to keep protesting so this change we think is happening is actually going to stick. Even though black people are not a monolithic group of people as far as how our politics go and how we do everything, what happens to us happens to us as a collective. If you're one of them black people who think, oh, I got a good job, I'm, I ain't with the rest of y'all. At the end of the day, a lot of people get that black wake-up call. Not only is racism obviously unacceptable, but we actually have to actively work against it. Because my livelihood is, is tied to this this platform is easy for me to get uncomfortable and say, hey, I don't got to do this. Like, <laughs> just post a little black square. Unfortunately, that's not gonna be sufficient enough to ensure that I have a future on this planet Earth. I am tired of seeing our black men die. Cops are violent to black people, and that is a well-known fact. Every day, people who are supposed to protect us are killing us. There's an issue of injustice, there's an issue of racism, there's an issue of power. There's a social contract that we all have, that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken, and they are lucky that what black people are looking for is equality and not revenge. Our second round table will focus on what is happening now that is different from Ferguson, Eric Garner's death, or any other moment in American history. Once again, leading this panel is award-winning broadcast journalist, Soledad O'Brien. 
Hey everybody, I'm Soledad O'Brien. Thank you for joining us for this special social event broadcast. We are about to explore the criminalization of African Americans in this country. We're also gonna break down what institutional racism means and how laws are used disproportionately to affect black people. Joining me today, YouTube creator Amber Whittington, American civil rights activist Alicia Garza, and the CEO of We On Records, Minnesota Fats. Talk to me a little bit, um, if you will, uh, Alicia, because this has been so much of your civil rights work, where you saw the roots and why Black Lives Matter, which you co-founded, became such an important part of that conversation. As you well know, years ago, it was very hard to get people to embrace it. Today, people are marching in the streets chanting it. So first and foremost, what we know is that policing in black communities has always been incredibly contentious. And it's been contentious for a few reasons. One, black communities have intentionally been disinvested from over time, whether that be resources for hospitals, resources for grocery stores and fresh food, resources to be able to have impact over the decisions that are, are shaping our lives. Black communities have been essentially rendered powerless inside of a series of structures that make rules on our behalf that organize and shape our lives. And so the role of policing then in that context has meant that often police are a force in our communities that frankly are used to control and contain uh, people who have been denied access to the things that make us human and the things that we need to survive and live well. And you've heard you know, across the nation that policing in affluent and white communities always looks very different than it looks in black communities, whether they're affluent or not. And so I, I think it's important for us to understand that Black Lives Matter really comes out of uh, this, this framework around what happens in black communities and to black people, not just at the hands of law enforcement, but as a result of a long time disinvestment in our communities that has left us without the political power, the economic power, and the social power to live as all Americans should be able to live. Minnesota, Alicia mentions that policing in white communities looks very different than it does in black communities. And I would add to that, voting looks very different in white communities than in black communities, and grocery stores look very different, and schools, public schools look very different. Where do you see the crisis being solved? We have a, a very uh, complex problem here. Um, Policing's origin is known to come from slave catching. You know, we have been uh, systematically um, focused on from the beginning, you know, oppressed from the beginning in these situations. So because you don't have adequate, you know, health care, you're, you're, you know, you're sick, you're mad, so you can't pay attention in school. Now you don't have adequate education, so now you can't go out and get a job. And then you, you know, you, then you go out and you do things in, 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 in society that feed into a stereotype because you're trying to feed your family. Now you're a criminal. This problem has turned so complex. We have trauma within the community, and partly, a big part of that is mass incarceration. And it started from the crime bill, and what has happened, and the effects of that since that point, as well as a lot of other factors. So the U.S. is only 4% of the population in the world, right? But we have 25% of the world's incarcerated people. And then within that, 50% of people are African-American people, black people, when we only account for 13% of the population. So if you think about it in that, we are, we are hurting as a community and we are so far behind on, on helping our community and even understanding, um, acknowledging that. And then, like Alicia was saying, putting the proper resources to our community. The, the, one of the big parts where we were just speaking of is education. And people don't realize that our schools are funded by property tax. Property tax in an area. So if we have an area that is not making money or an urban area, then of course the school's education is gonna look exactly like that. And it's just not fair. So we have to think about 
um, putting the proper uh, resources to communities that so that education in schools are equivalent across the board. Is systemic racism as a topic just too giant for for people to try to figure out how to solve as a problem? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't think that it's too big of a problem for people to solve. I think it's lacked the courage and the political will for people to show up and solve it. And frankly, you know, systemic racism is a litany of rules that have been rigged against our communities for a very long time. A lot of people said, well, the way to solve this, black people said, the way to solve this is for us to look at ourselves. The way to solve this is to make sure that our kids pull their pants up. The way to solve this is to make sure that our kids don't put on hoodies, because these are all ways in which other people look at us and think that we are something that we are not. And that is also a part of the rules. We actually believe that the systems, meaning the rules in our lives, have intentionally been designed to leave black people behind. And black people have always been at the forefront of a, a level of brilliance in terms of innovation, in terms of reimagining what bad situations need to look like so that they're better for us. And I think that we need to deeply invest in that. We need to deeply invest in making sure that it's black folks who are not only changing the rules, but changing the way that politics works. Minnesota, we know that racism exists across every socioeconomic class for black people. Uh, so is it enough to say, hey, let's give economic empowerment to black people when there are plenty of rich black people who have stories that would talk about how they are uh, hounded in their own neighborhood by police, some socioeconomic empowerment uh, enough? I think writing a check or throwing money at a problem is going to handle it. But I think infrastructure is, is necessary. When you go to the hood and you see a kid who's 10 years old like me, and at 15 or 16 years old, you can have $100,000 in your, in your bedroom from doing things around your neighborhood, whether it's running packs or raking lawns or whatever. You know, this person is a, a businessman. This person can go out and identify needs, identify wants, you know, uh, he can he could do um, payable accounts, you know, you owe me this, you owe me that, hey, you hold that, you hold that. This is a systematically inclined person. And if you invested in that, then that would bloom into, you know, what would Wall Street look like if we had a puffy on Wall Street? Uh, Alicia, this is now this is now a multicultural movement. How have you seen things change since 2013 when you co-founded Black Lives Matter? I mean, when we started this organization, uh, it started from a hashtag. We built out a series of social media platforms, and then we encouraged people who were pissed off about things online to get together and do things about it offline. And really, there were a lot of black folks who were about it. And there were a lot of other people who were not black who were saying, well, why can't it be all lives or black lives and all of these other lives, right? And we had to do a lot of work because frankly, we had to explain that, sure, we also want all lives to matter, but that's not the world that we live in. And that's the world that we're fighting for. So if you believe all lives matter, then you've got to fight like hell to make sure that black lives matter so that we can get to all lives matter. I'm so heartened by everything that I see happening in the streets. The multiracial character of marches and protests and uprisings, not just here in the United States, but around the globe. It's incredible and it's humbling to watch. And I'm so honored to have been the smallest piece of this puzzle. I think you're being kind of modest when you talk about the smallest difference, but we'll let that go for a minute. Amber, I'm gonna give you the final question today, if I may. Um, some people have described this as a moment. Some people have said, no, it's a moment that's turning into a movement. Why do you think this is such a, has been so embraced by young people like yourself? You know, I, I don't know. This is such a level question because I feel like I was just talking to, to on an earlier call this morning, actually, with the president of Color of Change, which I know Alicia works really close with Rashad, about influencers, whether it's like the Gen Z, Gen X, paying attention to this movement right now. Everybody's doing it in a very different way, but what I'm noticing is that people are showing up. 
Amber Worthington with us, Alicia Garza, and Minnesota Fats. Thanks, guys. I appreciate talking to you. We need to talk. I hope that we can live in a world where racism and prejudice are in the past, but the realist in me knows that we need to fight it at every turn. It is so much more than just not being racist. It's time to stop being silent. You have a responsibility to speak up and stand with the black community during these times. Not just on social media, but in real life. Yep, yep, I said it. But sometimes you have to take to the streets. Sometimes you march. You, uh, you force your voice to be heard. Now I understand that there is this saying, do not have conversations about religion or race at the dinner table. And you wanna know what I say? Fuck that. I say that is the perfect opportunity to have those hard conversations. Now more than ever, it is imperative that you vote if you want your voice to be heard. Ask yourself, how do you wanna remember your role in this? And with that, I say, let's go. Put on our fucking boots because it's time to march. White silence is compliance. White silence is violence. Be brave, challenge yourself, and challenge the people around you. Please stand up for what you believe in and use your voice. Our next panel deals with a very complex subject, but we will focus on a few top line questions that get us to the heart of the matter. What is white privilege? How and why has that privilege been weaponized? Whose obligation is it to end a power that has been used to oppress tens of millions? To lead the discussion on the responsibility of white privilege, please welcome back Roland Martin. Hey folks, Roland Martin here, host of Managing Editor, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's continue our conversation dealing with the issue of race in America. What is the responsibility of white privilege? My guest, Chad Smith. A comedic YouTube content creator with over 800,000 subscribers and 44 million views. Also, Michael Skolnick. He is an entrepreneur, film producer, news commentator, civil rights activist, and motivational speaker. Michael doesn't have enough to do. He's a partner and co-founder of the Soze Agency. Previously, he was the president of GlobalGrind.com. And closing us out, Eddie Glaude Jr., an American academic, chair of the Department of African American Studies and the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. It's a double-sided business card, Eddie. He's also an MSNBC contributor. All right, folks, let's get right into it. Uh, Michael, I want to start with you. You're the resident white guy in our panel. Um, the responsibility of white privilege. We're seeing companies responding. We're seeing politicians. But are we seeing a real response to race in America? Well, Roland, I've certainly gotten older over the years, and I've seen a lot in this country. It is not enough for us white people just to recognize our privilege or speak of our privilege or talk about our privilege. We must act uh, on that privilege, and we must act to dismantle the systems and the structures that hold up uh, the 400 plus uh, year history of racism in this country. So as an ally, uh, I have spent the majority of my life to move from an ally to an accomplice. It is no longer good enough just to be an ally. It's no longer good enough just to say I'm going to show up for black people. I'm going to show up when people have asked for me to show up. We also have to show up when they are not asking. We have to show up when they are not the ones in the street. When we are in our family rooms or in our dining room tables or having conversations at our jobs, Eddie, you're at Princeton. You, they've had to deal with these issues. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, very racist president. Uh, that's, they, this has been an issue on college campuses, too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the way in which Princeton narrates his history, black folk are like latecomers. We are the recipients of charity. We're not integral parts of the story of Princeton. And so part of what the students were demanding in that moment is, is really how do you tell a story of Princeton that is not heralding a past, but actually uh, as aspirational, that actually reflects the current Princeton of today and the values that animate and organize uh, the institution. And this is really important. Usually when there's a critique of white allyship, what, what, is, what is being spoken of is that there is a view of racial justice that's being held and, and, and proposed by our quote-unquote white friends that's philanthropic in its orientation, that they view racial justice as a charitable enterprise, something to be given, right? Um, and as long as we think about racial justice in that way, we're caught within the frame. So we have to have our white brothers and sisters deconstruct this idea that racial justice, that justice period, is a gift that they can give to anyone. It's not theirs. 
to give anyone because it's not their possession. Uh, Chaz in Dr. King's book, Chaos Our Community, where do we go from here? He literally talked about that. He said how white America was not fully prepared to even deal with the history of this country because they've never really confronted it. Isn't that the same with white privilege that there are people who say, wait a minute, I don't have any white privilege and they're white. Right, right. White people believe that they don't have privileges because they just don't experience what we experience as minorities. I can say that myself as a man, I don't experience the same things that a lot of women do. I realize, whoa, okay, there might be something else going on here. Michael, it's part of the problem, the phrase white privilege anyway, because when people hear that, they think, oh, privilege means, oh, rich people. And so there are people who say, I don't have any money, I'm broke, so therefore I don't have white privilege. Yeah, I mean, also privilege also insinuates there's a superiority even in that saying white privilege. It still reinforces at times, you know, the racism, the inherent racism that, you know, is, is in this country. But I also want to say, Roland, as white people, racial justice is not about us giving black people anything. Racial justice is also about liberating ourselves from the racism that has been ingrained in us since we've been children, since we've been taught as young people in this country to believe we're better, to believe we're superior, to believe that we're smarter, to believe all these things that are not true. And so our job of recognizing that, that privilege inside of us is to relieve ourselves of that cancer, which is racism, to get rid of it so we can liberate our minds and be in much greater relationship with those black brothers and sisters and Latinx brothers and sisters, and AAPI brothers and sisters, so we have removed ourselves of that disease of racism or, or relieved ourselves of that disease of racism or elevated our minds to a greater level of consciousness by doing the work to recognize what we have and what that privilege does to us, which creates that cancer and creates that disease, which I don't want. And for my white brothers and sisters who are watching out, I promise you, you don't want. It is part of the problem, and I'm not letting anybody off the hook, but this is part of the problem that we're dealing with white folks, just like black folks, who've had to learn his story and not actual history. And so it becomes, well, no, this, this is what I was taught. I didn't know these things. There are people who say, geez, I, I was an adult before I actually learned about uh, these real issues. Isn't this also part of the problem with white privilege and what we're confronting in America right now? You know, Roland, that's such a great question. You know, and in some ways we have to describe it as a kind of willful ignorance. And I think part of what has to happen, I think, is a kind of re-narration. Uh, a kind of retelling of who we are. That's what the 1619 Project sought to do. We, it brought up a whole host of questions, but it sought to re-narrate the story. When we begin to tell ourselves a different story about the evils, about the cruelty, about the joys, about the triumphs, where black folk and brown folk are not objects of charity or we're not latecomers or we're not being civilized, but we're co-participants in the project, then we open up space to imagine ourselves differently. I'm really honestly believing and hoping that this will not just be a trend, that um, people are truly going to begin to see people of all colors and ethnicities and backgrounds as equals, um, that people will begin to have equal opportunities, that these systems that have that have been that America was built on are gonna begin to be stripped away and the foundations will be rebuilt um, in ways that all people have greater opportunities to push for what we know is right. Michael, what is a white ally? What does a white ally look like and what sort of things they should be mindful of when it comes to language and also leadership in black spaces? So one is first to believe black people. Two, in this moment and in this movement, this movement is leaderful. Don't think you are showing up with the answer. It is leaderful with black people, it is leaderful leaderful with black women, is leaderful with queer black people. So when you go to the march, and please go to the march, bring your children, bring your loved ones, bring your parents, show up at the demonstration, show up at the protest. But when you go, ask, where can I be of service? Not how can I help? Where can I be of service? Should I march in the back? Should I march in the side? Should I put myself in between the police and you? Where can I be of service? So first is recognizing your place in this moment. And so in those moments, speak up, stand up, say something. And it's not about getting kudos or getting a, a applause on social media or your black friends saying good job. It's about you knowing who you are as a human being and you, who you are as a white person and saying that I am not going to witness this and be silent. That to me is the next step 
of where us white people have to go beyond allyship into a level that this is, as, as Eddie said, this is not charity work. This is liberation work for us too. Mm. For, to carry that disease in your head. When you get cancer, I'll shut up, I speak too much, but when you get cancer, people tell you, I hope you get through it. I hope you I, F cancer. Racism is a cancer. Get, I want it out of my system. I have to do the work to get it out of my system. And I, I, I beg, I urge any white person watching this who feels that sensation of racism inside of them to look deep inside of them and say, do they want to live a life of fear, a life of hate, a life of pain? Or do they want to live a life of joy and liberation and freedom? Jimmy Baldwin makes a distinction in the evidence of things not seen between white people and people who happen to be white. And he says, I love, I happen That's to right. love a lot of people who happen to be white, and then there's white people. And he's trying to get, oh, get us the sense of what the ideology of whiteness is doing to overdetermine how mm. one understands oneself. Michael Scotty, <sighs> Eddie Glott, Chad Smith. Gentlemen, we appreciate it. In there, you get loud to support our performance, to voice your opinion, to push us past the finish line. You paint your signs and paint your faces and match your colors and chant with the crowd. In there, you put us on your back while we put the city on ours. In there, our triumphs are yours because when we win titles, we're all champions, right? And there you ask us to move the chains, apply pressure, go for the jugular. You scream our names and wear our names and protect our names because we're supposed to be family in there. But what about out here? Are you willing to scream for these names out here? Are you willing to paint and chant and walk past the finish line with us out here? You see in there, you make noise when the game is on the line. Are you making noise when our lives are on the line? And there we said, Liberty, justice, my heart was broken. Obviously, Trayvon Martin for, situation. We're highlighting a long the parents time. of 400 years Tamir of systemic and oppression. John Crawford. Did the message get lost out here? And there you tell us to move the chains. But are you helping us break them out here? And there you tell us to go for the jugular. But are you stopping the system from going for ours out here? You want to protect our legacy in there? Protect our rights out here. You want to be champions in there? Champion our cause out here. If you cheer for us in there, stand with us out here. We are unsafe in our blackness and we are unsafe in our transness because your imagination does not include black people. When black is the trannies looking to, to be liberated, there are many reasons why people refuse to choose to see beyond their own experiences and there is black trans death and black queer violence in there and behind each of those reasons and behind each of those opinions. I don't want to die on the waiting list. So I'm done asking, can I come? I'm demanding that you come with me because our freedom begins with our freedom to be. Our next discussion will center on how police across the nation have escaped justice after killing black people and how the system continuously attempts to devalue the power of black life. Some Americans have chosen to ignore this fact, but for the black community, it has been a daily reality for over 400 years. Over the centuries, we have dealt with the terror of slavery, followed by the promise of reconstruction, only to be met with Jim Crow laws, beatings and burnings, lynchings, killings by cops and the horror of mass incarceration. The voices of a new generation have been joining the cause and this conversation. Here to lead our next panel is author, journalist, 
and television commentator, Roland Martin. Hey folks, Roland Martin here, and welcome to an open and necessary discussion about the killing of our black bodies. Why is there so much racial disparity in the way black people are treated upon arrest? And more importantly, how can we close the gap on how many of us are dying due to an antiquated system of oppression? Here with us, we have American attorney and politician Bakari Sellers, also with a book on the New York Times bestseller list, writer, comedian, and political commentator Baratunde Thurston, and finally, New York Times bestselling writer and editor Roxanne Gay. Glad to have all of you to the show, folks. When you see this, when you see what's going on, the protest, is this truly a critical juncture, a movement to really fix a lot of the inequities in dealing with police reform in America? I would actually say that we've been here in this country before. In 1955, this country was captivated by a picture of Emmett Till. And he was thrown in the bottom of the Mississippi for allegedly whistling at a white woman. And we now know that Carolyn Bryan, as she was trying to get into heaven, uh, flat out lied. So we, we've been at this moment before. I think that the largest question we have to ask ourselves is will we miss this moment like we've missed those moments? I think the difference is that the world saw a man's life being extinguished on video for almost 10 minutes. That seems to be different in the previous cases. This one was different in that we did indeed see almost nine minutes of this poor man being brutalized. and to hear George Floyd begging for mercy and begging for his mother. I, I think that really reached a lot of people and made a lot of people who were previously numb to police violence that black people face every single day when dealing with law enforcement. I agree. Uh, I will add that I think part of what makes this moment feel different, we are still in the middle of a pandemic. In the midst of that shared sacrifice, we saw someone sacrifice right before our eyes and something else snapped. We don't have the distractions of sports to take our eyes off this. ESPN is blank, so we are all forced to stare at this truth, at least for the moment. And that is a subtle but important difference. Okay, how are we now going to harness all of this street power to then put it into public policy to see those type of changes? In most of our cities, the police departments are the number one source of spending. That means we live effectively in a police state. So what folks are calling for is a redistribution of those resources that's happening on the ground in Minneapolis. Neighbors are patrolling their own neighborhoods. People are calling the cops mm -hmm. less. The Minneapolis public schools have canceled their contract with the Minneapolis Police Department, so has the university. And the city council may end up working to dismantle the police department and redistribute that function to a broader set of more compassionately competent people rather than just folks who've been up armored by a federal government which cannot provide N95 masks to nurses but can give a Humvee to a local PD. This is what is important about this conversation because while this week we buried George Floyd, we also had people waiting in line three, four, five, six hours to vote. And we cannot lose sight of that. And Roxanne, that's, I think, what is so substantive about this moment. Yes, you tweet, yes, you post, but you also move these politicians to act and you, you tell them, we're not going to wait, you can do it now. We hear time and again that we have to wait, that we have to allow for due process, that we have to vote, and they have not served us. And so we are looking for immediate relief from police brutality. Until George Floyd, I was very skeptical about abolition, but now I'm all for it because clearly half measures are not working. And I do hope that we are up to the challenge. Bartun Day, Roxanne just used the word challenge. People are demanding accountability of cops. Too much power, too little accountability, that's a problem. Policing began as slave patrols. The whole design of the system is very little to do with public health and safety and very much to do with control. Even these chiefs, we've had reform-minded chiefs come and go. Minneapolis is on their third reform-oriented police chief, and they are among the worst performers in terms of disparate outcomes for black people. Bakara Bartuni said it's not about uh, color, but this what we, it is about color. It's the color blue. And what the public is now seeing is how this entire apparatus has been set up to give nearly all of the benefit of the doubt to the police, and they know exactly how to use it and abuse it. Uh, you know, my father was shot February 8, 1968, along with 28 others on the campus of South Carolina State College, as it was known at the time. 
It was Jim Crow's final hiding place. It was a small whites only bowling alley in Little Orangeburg, South Carolina. They were shot by South Carolina state troopers, by law enforcement who used deadly double-eyed buckshots to fire into the group of students. It was the first time in our country's history that federal charges had been brought against law enforcement officers for killing black folk. All of the officers were found not guilty and my father, uh, as a member of SNCC, was charged, tried, and convicted of rioting uh, and deemed to be an outside agitator. Um, and so this is not new. When young people are, are watching this show, I want them to understand what racism is. Roxanne, district attorneys are critically important. The people have been trying to elect DAs who want to protect and serve the people, yet you have police forces and other law enforcement agencies who have an attitude of, oh, how dare you do that? You are supposed to be on our side. People are very attached to the narrative that the police are infallible and all powerful. And so unfortunately, you can elect a progressive district attorney, but if they are not surrounded by other progressive people and a system that is willing to let them do their jobs, they are neutered. We have to hold the police accountable. And if our district attorney is not willing to do that, if our district attorney is being selective about which crimes to prosecute, then that person should no longer be in office. The Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968 because King got assassinated. It had been, uh, they had, of course, they had filibustered it for two years before that. Why am I saying that? It's no shock that we're seeing changes in the country since George Floyd was murdered because in America, it has always been black blood that had to be spilled for things to change. Bakari, Roxanne Baratunde, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Dear George, Brianna, and Ahmad, and the named and unnamed victims of racial terror and violence, may you rest in power. You should still be here with us, and we all feel the collective grief of that truth. May we speak your names with an abiding commitment to justice. And may we honor you with a determination to remake this world a better place than you left it. Your murders are tragedies because they did not need to happen. But in a world that grossly devalues black life, you were taken from us far too soon. May we honor you with the determination to remake this world more equitable. Although there is now a stain on our nation's moral character, my hope is that we can learn a collective way forward that honors your memories. May your memory be the place of our resistance. And may you live on in us as we fight to build a better America for all of us. May we never stop fighting for brighter futures. May we see an end to senseless violence and police brutality. I'll never forget you and all that your lives could have become. Rest in power. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Arbery. Those are just four of many names of brothers and sisters whose lives we mourn and also hold up high. As we continue to pound for the sound of change, let's take two minutes, let our voices be still, and remember those taken from us.
In the words of Will Smith, racism isn't getting worse, it's getting filmed. The violent and criminal actions of those who kill the innocent among us are being captured on phones and cameras, allowing our community, the nation, and the world to bear witness to police brutality and to the violence that others thought was in the past, but we have long known is ever-present today. To moderate the roundtable on that very subject, once again, here is Soledad O'Brien. Hey everybody, I'm Soledad O'Brien and welcome to this YouTube live stream event. Today we're going to be discussing what it means to bear witness with the help of social media like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook mixed in with technology. Our panel today is going to discuss the ways in which these social videos are both helping and hurting the pursuit of social justice. Let me introduce you to our panelists today, uh, YouTube creator Prince EA, cultural curator, author and advocate for the hashtag smart brown girl, Jewel Z, American artist and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, Patrice Cullors. It's nice to see you guys. Thanks for talking with me. I'm always divided when I see a, a, a video that is depicting, for example, police brutality. Do I share it because it's important to let people know? Is it too much? Is it too painful? It's usually brutal and overt. In some cases, somebody dies at the end of it. Is this a debate that you have as well around what you share and what you post and what you refuse to? Many of us um, don't watch the videos. Uh, many of us have said that those videos um, are too triggering. Um, much of those videos are, are really for white communities who have claimed that black folks have been hyperbolic about what's happened to us. And they're oftentimes the first way that a family knows about what's happened to their loved one. And they have to relive that experience over and over and over again. On the other hand, um, the use of videos have been incredibly important in building awareness and also allowing for a new conversation in this country about police violence and police terror. And I think that's been incredibly important. So it's not so black and white. Patrice's response was spot on. I, you know, for me, the only way that we can, I think, make the world better is through awareness. We have to show what's going on. When I saw the video, you know, the George Floyd video, I couldn't make it through. And I haven't shared it, but as a creator, and I think we're going to get to this later, as a creator, I, I booked a ticket to L.A. that next day to create content around this. It can definitely hit on some wounds, but it's also raising awareness, and I think awareness, it, it, it slightly tilts the, the scale that way in, in, in its importance. So I think we always should, should spread awareness about what's going on. You know, I think it was Will Smith who said, racism isn't getting worse, it's just getting filmed. Yeah, I would agree. I think sometimes you even see videos that are released literally months after an incident and only because they've been leaked does it lead to some investigation or at least uh, the news starts covering. How do you navigate this conversation? I don't necessarily, I don't watch these videos of black death. I don't need to watch them to understand. I think the history has always been there. So I don't participate in um, sharing these kind of videos. Um, I might participate in the conversation about the politics that undergird this. I might participate in the conversation about what do we do with this from here, but I don't necessarily participate in the sharing of these images because I actually don't know that they do much good anymore at this point. I just think that there's so, sort of this sort of morbid obsession with absorbing trauma and the way outrage and headline packaging works and clicks. And I just think there's a lot, there's a lot more complicated things happening um, than simply this idea of, oh, is it informing people that black folks are being violently killed by the police? I think we've, we've known that, like, we're, how many years since the Reagan administration are we past now? Prince EA, back to you, because Julesy kind of laid out how she thinks about how to respond to that kind of information and what kind of content she wants to be involved in. So when you got on a plane to LA, what were you creating? What was your response? I have a little bit of a unique perspective. When, when Ferguson happened with Mike Brown, I lived 10 minutes away. My father has been in law enforcement for over 30 years in the city of St. Louis. My brother's in law enforcement. We're in a time when the energy can either be, we can, we can, we can suffer inside of the trauma 
or we can somehow transmute this energy into something positive. So I think the platform is it's it's a double edged sword. While it can be while y'all can use this pen to write a beautiful novel, I can also use it to write some type of hate speech. Patrice, do you think Black Lives Matter could have taken off without social media? No, not at all. I don't think that um, black people's issues um, specifically have been at the forefront of media, um, traditional media. I think we've spent um, many decades witnessing um, a true bastardization of black people via media, whether it was the 90s, 80s and the 90s, and the role um, uh, mainstream media played in the creation and the myth of um, uh, you know, crackheads and the welfare queen and um, the, the visual of the super predator. And so I think it's incredibly important that social media uh, became this new robust um, platform for black folks um, and especially um, young black people, especially young black women, uh, queer folks, trans folks, because these are the folks who are often left out of the conversation. You know, it took almost a year and a half, two years for the media, the traditional media, to, to see Black Lives Matter. We had already created it in 2013 after the acquittal of George Zimmerman. It wasn't until a year and a year plus late, later after Mike Brown's death um, and the uprising in Ferguson where the media said, oh, there's this thing that we should be following. I think, I think social media has been good on some level of breaking down some, some of the barriers, right? that were upheld by the um, elitist system of mainstream media, but I also think that they replicated some of those elitist structures that have kept people out of mainstream media. And there is this push very consciously to amplify voices, but what I'm seeing is people still amplifying voices of like their wealthy friends. And we could do a lot better of job of not just talking to poor black people, but including the voices of poor black people, of having a diverse range of socioeconomic bases of acknowledging all the privileges that we personally come from as individuals and understanding that our ability to succeed, to succeed in society as black folks often means that someone in the black community is getting left out. Darnella Frazier was harassed, you know, and worse after posting um, now what was, I think, certainly as a journalist, a really, really important video. And she's not the, the first that's happened to. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, it, it comes with the territory, you know, while, I've gotten harassed. I've gotten, you know, racist remarks thrown at me, death threats for me posting things on social media. So it comes with the with the territory, unfortunately. Now, what can social media do to protect people like this? That's a question that I, I, I humbly have to say I don't know. I think the I think the this is a mm -hmm. question that should be asked in the boardrooms of, of social media. Um, management, you know, in San Francisco at these these corporations? It's a great question, um, and I don't really have an answer, but I know it's a question we need to ask. Social media is not a free society. Like, it's a profitable industry. Because the problem with Darnell, Darnella Frazier's safety is not, a, is not at the fault of me, right? It's at the fault of how do these industries and these companies, these corporations, how are they profiting from the people that are allowed to stay on their platforms and attack these individuals? Patrice, I'm gonna give you the final word on all of this. Uh, at the end of the day, what does bearing witness mean to you? Someone like Darnell, do you see Darnellis Frazier that down the road there'll actually be a way to protect those who are bearing witness? Is it important to make sure that they have a, an, an opportunity to share those stories as tough as they may be? Absolutely. I think um, this is a question not just for social media, but it's also a question for um, our own communities where we live and breathe with the rise of white nationalism and white supremacy is that, you know, for a long time people said, well, it's okay, it's the right, right for free speech. But we started to realize that that right for free speech that happened on social media often ended in someone's uh, losing their life in, 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 in the real world. And so we have to be careful about what we wish for. We also have to be really earnest about what we demand. And I think um, everybody who is speaking on behalf of black lives should be protected both online and offline. Patrice Cullors joining us, Joel Z as well, and Prince EA. Thank you so much for this conversation, guys. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. Good to be with you. In every fight for human rights and justice, there are heroes. And this moment also has many heroes. One hero I want to acknowledge and give deep thanks to is Darnella Frazier. 
It's because of Darnella that we bear witness to the modern day lynching of George Floyd. This young black girl, only 17 years old, took her phone and recorded the killing of George Floyd. Although Darnella was scared, uh, scared to hold her phone, scared to hit record, scared of the police and their unapologetic violence playing out in front of her, she still held up that phone. Darnella still found the defiant grace and courage to record what was happening. Like Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till, who insisted on an open casket so that the world could see how her son was lynched and murdered. Darnella has insisted that the world see how George Floyd was killed. We thank you, Darnella. You are our hero. In a society where so many feel they are unable to speak out loud, music has always provided our artists and people an outlet, a widely accepted way to express ourselves without fear of suppression or retribution. To this day, as if 400 years of slavery wasn't enough. From the womb, as a black man, we was born to be tough. Lynched, whipped, burned was the thing of the past. But to this day, jailed, raped, gunned. How long will it last? Being black is not a crime. But why does it seem like my people dying all the time? Over 200 years of subjugation and abuse. Sometimes I need you to acknowledge that my pigment itself has its own story. The, 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 when I was 10 years old riding my bike down the street with my cousin and, and a grown man stopped his car in the middle of the road to scream profanities at us and, and call us the n-word. Tell me, what, what do you want with my ashes? My hair, my hip bones, my breasts, my bone marrow. Speak to me of your barbaric fascination with my skin. Dark like molasses, black like the night. United we stand, together we fight. We're angry because we're victims of a systematic bias and what we fight against in itself is the violence. If we cry, if we scream, if we protest on the streets, it's a sign to the world that we still have a heartbeat. There's Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, all die from, well, just being us. I will prance in your darkness. I will be big and masterful in my arrival. Swift in my exit, I will glow. Bear fangs, leave blood. There's beautiful people of all shapes and sizes and shades. And me acknowledging that they have shades and that they've had different experiences than me because of their backgrounds, it's not a bad thing. If we really want to make this country great, we have to learn to embrace love and drive out hate. We showed you nothing but peace. We done being quiet. To this day, to this day, to this day. Angela Davis once said, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. Over half a century after the civil rights movement, we continue to echo the cause for justice, the demands for freedom, and the need for concrete action as we chart the way forward. America needs a healing. Many people in this moment are making a choice, a choice to speak, a choice to stand up, a choice to transform, and a choice to commit to break down the policies that have created this system and structure of injustice. To continue the conversation, before the manifestation, leading the discussion focused on now, tomorrow, and the road ahead, the great Jamel Hill. Welcome everybody, my name is Jamel Hill and this is your final panel uh, for the night. Uh, and it's called Tomorrow, appropriately so. Where do we go from here? What does our tomorrow actually look like? How do we press forward? Uh, how do we achieve and get something out of all this momentum that has been built? Uh, with me tonight, I have a terrific panel that's going to help me sort through a lot of these issues and uh, hopefully give us some good words that will carry us through through tomorrow. I'd like to introduce first Baratunde Thurston, who is a comedian uh, who hosts a show on Instagram uh, live on lockdown, uh, also is an activist and a writer. Uh, speaking of writer, 
We also have another one in our midst, Kimberly Jones, who is an activist and writer as well. And you may have seen her recently because of a commentary she did on racism that went viral that millions of people have seen and many have called the best breakdown of racism that they've ever seen. Uh, a very deserved compliment and not hyperbole. And finally, last but not least, we have Andrew Hawkins, a former NFL player. And before Colin Kaepernick started his protest in 2016, Andrew Hawkins uh, called attention to the murders of Tamir Rice and also John Crawford. Thank you all for joining me uh, this evening. I'd like to open this up to the entire panel, our very first question. Um, and I'll start with you, uh, Baratunde. Um, what does a future without racism to you look like? Oh, that's, thank you. I'm so used to getting asked, how do you feel? And that answer is <laughs> terrible. I'm exhausted and I'm angry and I'm terrible. So what does a future without racism look like? It looks prosperous. It looks like resources allocated in a just fashion. It looks like us being able to face a challenge like the climate crisis with the full capacity of our society with us because we have literally unlocked them from behind the cages where we put too many and made them be part of the solution. Justice is delicious, yo. <laughs> what does it look like for you, Kimberly? Um, I love that he started with the word prosperous because that that is exactly how I see it as well. I'm looking at a place where we finally, um, being black people who have been the architects of cool, that we're finally getting our just due. And not because someone is handing it to us, just because in its natural state it is happening organically and that there are no roadblocks to block us from getting what we, what we earn. And I definitely want to see more of my brothers free and able to prosper and living without fear. Hawk? It's just do. I, I mean, that's the, the word that comes to my mind. I mean, I have an eight-year-old son and twin five-year-old daughters, and, you know, they're young and don't understand all these things and everything I teach them about working hard and everything will come to them. You have just do. It's a fair market. It's competitive. I'm an athlete. I appreciate that. And I think when you have that, the amount of creativity we have as a people, the source of energy and love and, you know, just kind of shaping the culture in America, that's what no racism looks like. Look, I, I'm older than I look, so I'm older enough to remember when similar conversations were had with Rodney King. We've seen points and flex in our history where these conversations have started, but they've never been able to be sustained. And certainly I don't remember a conversation quite like this one. So how do we take all of what's happening now and use it in a way for advancement. For me, a big chunk of that is gonna come down to economics. A lot of what happens in our community and our culture is based on lack of economics. You know, we have brothers who are sitting in jail right now because they can't pay a very small bond for a minimal crime and they've been in there for over a year. So we're gonna have to look at how we need to allocate the wealth in our communities and how we need to work on expanding the black dollar in our communities so that we can attack all of the issues that are facing us, whether that's health care, education, um, the prison system. So I think that needs to be the primary focus because beyond voting, we need to lobby. We need to make sure that we're getting these laws changed and that things are looking the way we see them as a collective. Hawk, you have seen how the NFL in particular has suddenly evolved on this issue. And it's not just really the NFL. Companies all of a sudden want to have conversations about social justice and racism and all the issues that most of us have been bringing up for years. Is that something that we can trust and use to capitulate this movement forward? I don't think at this point it's something that we can just lean on somebody's word. I think we're past the point of people addressing this situation. I think years ago and years, as you talked about, from Rodney King to back in the 60s to even prior to that, we've been waiting for people to address something with their mouth and admit something. Now it's too late. We need action. Like, you know, we don't believe anything anybody says. We want to see things being put forth in action with the NFL and every other company. Like, what does your black executive team look like? What does your board of directors look like? What do your hiring practices look like? Press releases are fine, but furthermore, we need action. Now, Baron Tunde, one of the things that has been brought up as part of that action plan has been defunding and or dismantling uh, the police. Now, I have an issue with the verbiage because I think it's just low-hanging fruit for people who are intent on misunderstanding. But that being said, do you think the idea of defunding the police and all the money that's being poured in these uh, in these police department 
diverting it to other needier resources such as mental health services, such as public housing. Uh, how viable do you see that solution? I think it's the only way forward. Uh, I think if we look at the history of policing in this country, it was not designed for public health and safety. It was designed for population control. And when we look at the problems that we throw at officers to try to solve, it's mental health, it's housing instability, it's hunger, it's fines and fees and tax evasions and ticketing. Do all those require an up-armored man with a gun and no accountability? I don't think so. It's actually pretty absurd what we're asking cops to do with very limited tools of essentially violence. Excessive force is kind of built right in. When you look at the number one cost for most cities in the country, it's the police department. That's absurd. So we need to leave the realm of the absurd and leave in something a bit more balanced and sane. And we've got to shift those dollars to the experts and then fund teachers, fund fair wages, fund clean air and water, fund all of the things that when we lose the stress around those, we don't have to dial 911 in the first place. Um, I ask all of you, uh, do you feel as if there is a clear cut agenda that's being formed or or have we even begun to kind of unpack what that agenda looks like? Uh, Kimberly, why don't you chime in on that first? We're talking about a 500 year system of institutionalized racism that has just morphed itself into a new look every couple decades. It's going to take the white community to be prepared to, to grapple with and sit in what they have done and the benefits that they continue to receive based on that history, because this is not a black problem that they need to empathize with. This is a white problem that they need to fix. And so they need to be just as heavily involved in the repair of this, situ of this system as we are. And I don't know about you guys, but I've had more conversations with white people this week or in the last week or so about race. And it is kind of exhausting because it's very clear that while they might be well-intentioned, they haven't exactly done the work to necessarily participate meaningfully. So, uh, Hawk, I'll start with you, and I'm just really curious, what have your conversations with white people, if you had any, what have they been like with what happened with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery? Some of my best friends are white and, you know, people that I consider family, but to your point, Jamil, you know, we're in the information age. Go get as much information and understanding and understand, you know, what black people are grappling with, and it's not our responsibility to have to teach you that because we're not the ones that put it in place. It's exhausting, to be honest. So, you know, it's going to take for white people to take the initiative and educate themselves as much as they possibly can. And then we can start having the conversation because otherwise, to me, it comes across like you don't care enough to go find this information. And I know that's not the case with any other topic that we deal with in society. And to all the white people who may eventually watch this or are watching this, no kente cloth, please. Um, <laughs> Bar Baratunde, uh, what have your conversations with white folks been like uh, since all of this started? I put myself in a position. I literally wrote a book called How to Be Black. I gave a TED talk about how to deconstruct racism one headline at a time. So it will be a bit extreme for me to be like, don't ask me, because I put myself out there. Years ago, I, I co-hosted a podcast called About Race with a Latina woman, Raquel Cepeda, and a white man, Tanner Colby. And Tanner and I would have these conversations where I basically said to him, a lot of what we're saying right now, like, I'm tired, I've done all the teaching, read the books, go forth and prosper. And he's like, listen, Baratina, if you leave it to white people alone, we will mess this up. You know, so, so there is um, an honesty there that unguided uh, there's a there's a chance for this to go off the rails. And I think there are people who've positioned themselves There's folks. It's their whole business. Pay a black person to help you figure this out. Buy the book, you know, support the independent film and continue to do that work. The title of this panel is about tomorrow. I want to ask each of you and, and Hawk, I'm going to pass the baton to you first. We've come to a point of the apex of this conversation. It feels like this national conversation taking place about police reform and police brutality. What can't we leave this discussion without having this settled or agreed to, in your opinion? What, what should be the ask? My thing is believe black people, believe their experiences. When we tell you that this is what we've dealt with since the beginning of time and that every you know, black person that's been born in America, whether they're born affluent, whether they're born in the toughest neighborhoods, whether they're born food insecure, they went to the best schools, the experiences are the same. It shouldn't take us protesting in the streets of every major city in the United States 
for people to sit back and say like, oh, maybe you're telling the truth, right? Believe your American citizens, the black people and, and their experiences, then we can start to talk about what real change looks like. Baratunde, what do you feel is the major ask that we need to get accomplished out of this conversation? My ask is for white America to be invested in that future with us. It, it is not enough, uh, as has been said, to see this as a black problem. I want to help out the blacks. This is about helping out the society and creating, being as invested in an anti-racist future as we've been invested in a racist past and present. And once white America feels as invested in this, because there are gains to be made for them and their children and their grandchildren as well, it's not just charity for us, it's liberty and justice for all. Once they're on board with that, then we can unlock the keys and the codes to all of the pieces of this puzzle, but not until then. So my ask, get invested. This is all of our problem to solve. Kimberly, what's your ask? You got the same Google I got. And so it's, it's now time for us to get educated on the history that we've been living in so that we don't continue to just live in it. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems very simple. Um, like you all, I, I wish that we never have to have any of these conversations again. Um, unfortunately, history, often a predictor of the future, has taught us we probably will, but I'm just hoping it doesn't always feel like we're starting from ground zero every single time. Maybe we can be a little bit further ahead the next time uh, that we have to have this conversation. And hopefully it doesn't come because something horrendous and tragic has happened to another black person. Tragedy does not always have to be the facilitator for conversations like these. Uh, I want to thank everyone for listening, for watching, for learning. Um, make sure you use the Google, as Kimberly said, and stop asking black people about history that you can go look at for yourself. Uh, but more importantly, uh, stay engaged, stay involved, and as Baratunde said, stay invested. Uh, thank you and have a good evening. I think it's time for a change. I think we all see that. Change is going to happen. To make real change. To make real change. I will not tire until systematic racism is a thing of the past. We will stand up for what's right, and that's equality for all. We have a window in this moment. I will continue to use my platform to stand up for those who have been disenfranchised. I'll use my social media as a weapon against racism and bigotry and anything else in this country that needs to be torn down and rebuilt. I will listen so that I may learn and educate myself and others about what's going on in the world. It's the spread word on equality and justice. I will call my senators and local officials. I stand up for the black community. I will continue to shine light on the issues that we're dealing with. And I think the more people know about it, the more effective that we can be. I challenge you to learn about those experiences. Educate yourself and your friends and family. Hold other people accountable. Speak up and have tough conversations. It's time to stop being silent. Because if we don't speak up and educate others, we won't make a change. Let your voice be heard. May we never stop fighting for brighter futures. We must unite as one. Sticking together like this. We must stand as one. Connect beyond real or perceived differences. Reach out to one another and unite our movements because justice for black lives is justice for all. Empathy inspires a change of heart, which leads to a call to action, which leads to a change in legislation. To make real change, you can do a lot of the same things I can do. You have to fill out your census. Vote, vote, vote. In all elections, midterms and presidential. You can fight to protect voting rights for all Americans. You can use your privilege to help in the fight against racism. You can march, you can protest. Make your voice heard as you fight for your rights. Because if we don't, if we don't, if we don't. We are complicit. Because if, if we, we don't, don't, we are part of the problem. problem. YouTube is a platform that celebrates a diverse set of voices. But we recognize we need to do more to be a meaningful and powerful platform for the Black community. We will work to center and elevate Black voices and perspectives. And we are taking steps to ensure that Black users, artists, and creators can share their stories and be protected from hate and harassment. We will take action and do our part to dismantle systemic racism. I pledge to you, in solidarity with you, that we will do this because we believe that Black Lives Matter. We are nearing the end of this incredible event. 
one that I hope has been inspiring, informative, and that has challenged us as a community and as individuals to take action. Each of us has a role to play, and we must accept it. We have no choice. We have to do something to speak out, to march, to protest, to affect real change. Because if not now, then when?